God's word comes to us from 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, through, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. The scripture reading is available on your screen, as well as uh, uh, if you're worshiping from home, as well as the bulletins if you're worshiping here in person. So if you're there, I invite us to rise together for the reading of God's holy and sacred word. Let me read this for us. I invite you to follow along as I read this for us. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what, will, what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that when he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident that we are who, uh, that who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go to God in prayer once again. Father, we ask right now for you to calm our hearts. Let go of any distractions and focus in on you. Jesus, we ask that you speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, we ask of your presence to be near and close to us so that we can learn, grow, and be empowered on this Lord's Day. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. When we think about faith, our faith in Christ, do you think about your assurance of salvation? When we think about our assurance of salvation, are we confident that on judgment day, Jesus Christ will lead us to the rightful place in our eternal home? As we have been studying the letter of 1 John, this isn't just a simple, oh, God is love kind of letter. This impacts the practicality, the authenticity of living into that genuine faith, but most importantly, a righteous faith. If you imagine with me, the people that John was writing to are probably bickering right now. No, well, I'm right. No, no, no. Oh, no, I'm right. No, no. Well, do it this way. No, no, no. You got to do it this way. No, you got to live like this. No, you can't live like that. You got to live like. Some of you are like, oh, man, that's annoying. <laughs> but that's what's going on. And I don't know about you, but if I were John, I'd probably be fed up by now. Because with all these instructions. With all these warnings, it's, not, it's like they're not waking up. It's like they need another wake-up call or a reality check. So let's go back to our passage this morning as we unpack these verses on what God is trying to teach us. And verse 20, 28 says this, Now little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in the shame at his coming. John uses the words little children, not to demean somebody but to showcase that fatherly love that Jesus Christ had been exhibiting since day one. Now, if you recall from last week, we learned the word abide can also be translated as live or to have life or to remain. So in order to have life in Christ, we are called to be alive and live in confidence in Christ. So to remain in union with Christ, we are called to be and live in that confidence, to remain in union, to remain in communion, and, 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 and that should lead us to a place of utter surrender and assurance of salvation. You know, so many parts of Scripture teach us of this 
childlike faith. Childlike faith. I'll give you an example, and this isn't me bragging. But my son, he loves to help. Regardless of what he's been asked to do, he loves to help. If I say, for example, son, please clean up your Legos, right? Please clean up your Legos. He would then come to me and say, but can I help my sister with this? And I'm like, I just asked you to clean your Legos. And now you're asking if you can help and do something else and not do what you're supposed to do. But lately it's come to a point where he thinks he can help with anything. So there are times when we come back home from the store, he tries to convince me. He says, Dad, I'm strong. I can bring in those bags I can bring in those bags. Let me help. And I'm like, son, it's okay. I got it. He's like, no, let me help. And I'm like, you sure? I let him help. Five seconds later, I guess I'm not that strong. But I'm like, wow, clearly you're not going to be able to help. But wow, praise God for your confidence. And sometimes I'm like, what makes you think you can carry all those bags, son? But I think that's what the Lord's trying to teach us through this passage this morning. Where is that kind of confidence and assurance when we approach Christ? Right? Where is that confidence and assurance where we can say, just like that with that childlike faith, I'm going to be in heaven. I love Jesus. I am going to be sitting right next to the throne probably right before Abraham Lincoln, right? And that's where I'm going to be. Where is that confidence? When we have assurance with Christ, where is that confidence and assurance when we approach Christ, when we approach others with Christ on our side? Now, in the earlier part of the passage, we've seen many, many times that this was specifically addressed to believers who were being thrown off by false teaching. But now we have to question and wonder if John was addressing those that were ashamed at his coming. Because scripture is teaching us to have confidence, right? In regards to our faith. faith, He doesn't want us to be running into a little closet of shame in regards to our faith. We can have that confidence that if we're born in Christ, we're born of Christ. Look at verse 1 with me. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. What makes you a child of God? If someone asks you, hey, why are you a child of God? You're not even a child. How do we respond? What makes us a child of God? What does it mean to be a child of God? And Scripture is teaching us this morning, the love of our Father. Other verses, versions use the word, uh, they don't use the word given, but rather they use the word bestowed because the translation is to lavish. So if you say that differently, look at verse 1 with me as I say this. See what kind of love the Father has lavished on us. That changes it, doesn't it? Right? Lavished on us. That speaks of the manner of God's love being unconditional. God's love being overflowing. That speaks of the one-sided, nothing is needed in return kind of love that only comes from our God, the Father. You see, our identity in being the children of God doesn't mean a thing if we don't believe that our God loves us lavishly. Even when we fall. It's not just a simple, all right, God loves you, the end. It's a lavish, it's overflowing, unconditional kind of love. Verse 1 ends with this. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. This is kind of like a repeat of what we learned the other week. But John said this before, and it's like a continuing theme. But we Christians shouldn't be surprised or offended when the world is against us. We Christians shouldn't be surprised or offended if something doesn't seem right. Because we're not of the world. The world doesn't know how to deal with us. The world doesn't know how to deal with Christ. The world doesn't know how to deal with the Father's love. 
So if you continue at verse 2, John touches on something that the church back then and the church today still wrestles with. And that's the already versus not yet wrestle of salvation. You see, we are already the children of God. That's a fact. As his beloved, we are already saved because we don't save ourselves. Jesus already saved us. Even before we fall, even before we have that sin, even before we run away a couple years from now, Jesus already knows that we're going to come back if we are his beloved. However, we haven't fully realized or experienced the full benefit of salvation promised because we're still a work in progress. We're nowhere near perfect. We're nowhere near glory. We're not there yet. But this verse is also teaching us the anticipation, this expectation, and the hope. You know, I'll, I'll use my son as an example again, uh, as an example again, before he gets too old and he says, stop using me as an example in your sermons. But before I, I start my work day, right, there are times when my son wants to play catch. He loves baseball. So he wants to play a little baseball, a little catch in the backyard or the living room. But there are a few, uh, a few times, I confess, that I shrugged it off saying, you know, I've, I got to go to work. And he'll say, but can you play with me when you're done with work? And I'd be like, yeah, of course, and then not think about it. Confession. I wouldn't think about it. There are a couple times when I'd completely forget. And as I was preparing this morning's message, I had to repent. Because that was God teaching me something that I didn't even realize. You see, you see that was God. That was, God was teaching me. Why can't I be like my son? Living in anticipation. God was teaching me, why can't I be like my son? Have that childlike faith to live with that expectation. Because I later on found out that he told my wife and said, Mom, Dad's going to play with me after he's done with work. So he has this anticipation and expectation that I'm going to. But I had to repent. Because that was a God moment when God was trying to teach me. Where is that expectation and anticipation when it comes to Christ? Why can't I live with that expectation and say, you know what? God is going to bless our church. Even through this pandemic, God is going to bless our church. Why can't I say that in faith? Why can't I say God is going to answer that person's prayer? God is going to hear our prayer. God is going to revive our church. God is going to grow our church. God is going to make disciples of all disciples to go out and spread the word of God. Can I get an amen? Why can't we live in that anticipation? You know, we have so many families in our church that have battles, that have struggles. But I've said this before, but one thing that has happened ever since I've gotten here to be your pastor, one thing that has happened, right, we don't hurt by ourselves. We hurt together. If someone is struggling with an issue where their loved one has walked away from the Lord, we have somebody else that's struggling the same. If somebody has a knee replacement surgery. You know who I'm talking about. We have somebody else that has the same knee replacement surgery a couple months after that. If somebody has a back surgery, they have. So there's another person that had a back surgery. Was this all coincidence? You know, the list can go on. Was this all coincidence? I don't believe so. I don't believe it. I believe that God is at work. So why can't we live with that anticipation? Why can't we live with that expectation and have a confidence and hope that we can grow together as a body of Christ? An assurance of salvation where we can testify what Scripture says, that we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. Now, if verse 2 can be used like the definition of gospel hope, verse 3 is like the response to that gospel hope. Verse 3, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Knowing the end goal, the destination should cause us, should transform us to pursue that holy righteousness. It should cause us to pursue heavenly thinking and heavenly living because that's where we'll end up. That's where we should want to end up. You see, verse 2 and verse 3 throughout various parts of the scripture teach us about being imitators of Christ. 
being just like him. And if we believe in a pure, righteous, and holy God, then why aren't we trying to be just like him? Why are we trying to believe in a God who is uh, falling short all the time? No, we believe in a God who is pure, holy, and righteous. Why aren't we doing our best to try to be like him? Why do Christians go for the quick fix and shy away from the long reconstruction project to pursue holiness and righteousness? If you think about it, that's why Jesus came for us. He came to deliver us from sin. He came to des destroy the works of the devil. He came to showcase who the children of God were. John called, John called it out then, and I feel like he's calling it out right now. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is a complete disregard to God. Scripture teaches us here an important reminder that Jesus came to take away our sins but he was also taking on the penalty of our sins. You see, he was taking away the power of our sins. He was taking away the presence of our sins. Why? Look at verse 5. Because in him, there is no sin. Think of it this way. Because of our human nature, our sin capacity is capped out, right? I wish I had a glass prepared so I can, can, can have a visible example. But if I had a glass that was filled with all these rocks of sin, right? And I tried to put more rocks and more rocks and more rocks, it would keep overflowing. But for some reason, right, when it's already full and we shouldn't be putting more sin in, we keep putting it in over and over and over again. But Jesus, on the other hand, he had this capacity to take on not only our sins but everyone else's sins he had this capacity to take on the sins of the world because that's how large his glass was jesus knew we couldn't take away the power and presence of our sin in our lives by ourselves you see john's message here in this letter is plain and simple simple Living a habitual life of sin, living a hypocritical life of sin is inconsistent with living a life of abiding in Jesus Christ. If you are living a habitual life of sin, maybe you don't know Jesus yet. You see, too many Christians struggle with finding any and every excuse for their sin. Well, let me tell you, well, this, let me defend you with this. Let me give you the reason for this. There's too many Christians that struggle to find an excuse for every little sin rather than humbly get on their knees to grieve and confess their sins. Verse 7 teaches us, let no one deceive you. Like we've learned before, there's so many issues going on with false teaching. And that's why John's wanting to be very clear. The rest of verse 7 into verse 8 teaches us with this. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. If you think of kids sometimes, you're like, well, they know no better. And there's grace shown to the kids. I've experienced that with my parents sometimes. When I'm trying to scold or, you know, give a timeout to my son or my, or my daughter, out of nowhere, my father, a strict traditionalist of a father, comes to me and goes, come on, give him a break. He knows no better. I'd be like, Dad, come on. Sometimes we uh, adults are like, oh, these kids are innocent, and we brush them aside. But we don't realize that these kids are teaching us these God lessons and God moments and moments that we don't we'd even expect or fathom. These kids are teaching us the power of the gospel. These kids are teaching us this confidence without any shame to say, I love Jesus. To go into the stop and shop and go, I love Jesus. Even when people look at you all weird. Kids would do that, right? But that's what these kids are teaching us, the power of the gospel. You know, we're so focused sometimes to using the language of the world where we try to assimilate them into adulthood. When we're like, all right, you got to grow up this way. You got to grow up that way. We don't realize that it's kids that teach us the importance of that childlike 
faith. To have that confidence, to have that simplistic childlike faith should cause us to hold on to our faith that much more. You see, the fruit of doing what is right is revealed in our roots. So if our hearts are right with the Lord, what we say, what we do, will showcase that our hearts are right with the Lord. You see, that's what childlike faith teaches us. Being called children of God equates to the Father's forever kind of love. When we think about the words children of God, and I encourage you to talk about that with your families when you go home, being a children of God, being a child of God, doesn't matter what age we are. It doesn't matter what birth year we have. Why? Because being a children, uh, being a children of God, being a child of God, does not equate to age or years. You see where I'm coming with this? Being a children of God, being a child of God, equates to our faith in Christ. It equates to our identity in Christ. It equates to the Father's forever kind of love that He has for us in Christ. That's what it means to be a child of God. It doesn't mean, oh, we are young, we are baby Christians. No, it means that that's our identity, that we don't have any shame. I am a child of God. That is who we are. Being called children of God, that's our identity. We being called children of God means that sin is sin. It means righteousness is righteousness. More importantly, it means that we bear his name. We bear his nature. So not only is it the identity piece, not only is it the confidence piece, not only is it the Father's lavish love kind of piece, right? But it's also the identity piece in imitating and being his image bearers, right? I'll use my son as an example one last time as we wrap up. A lot of my relatives call him James Jr. A lot of my cousins, my uncles and aunts and my siblings, they call him James Jr. They're like, I can't believe he's just like you. I was like, what do you mean? You were, your, your son is acting just like what you did when you were three. They're like, what? Really? Then my mother would always be like, of course, he's your son. But you see this, he's bearing my name, he's bearing my identity, but he's also my son. Right? There are moments, right, when he helps Mr. Frank out to the car, right? When he's like, you know, I got to go help Mr. Frank, right? And apparently, I just found out that I would do that for some of the senior saints in my my church growing up when I was four, five, and my father was the senior minister of the church. Pre-COVID, you know, if you recall, when we were worshiping in the sanctuary, I would rush back uh, after the benediction, you know, during our last song, and to be ready to greet everybody going out, you know, because I'm your pastor. I want to greet everybody, give everyone a hug, and, and, and as they walk out and say, God bless you, have a blessed week, right? And, apparent, and if you recall, there are times when Isaac would, would run up and he'd be right next to me and try to greet people as well. But apparently I did that too when, I, when my father was ministering. Apparently I would run up after children's church and I would stand right next to him and they'd be like, hey, Reverend Lee, how you doing? Hey, James. And then, you know, and they'd go off. I would be bearing his attitude, his characteristics, his, and there are times when my mother would be like, it'd be nice if you're only, you know, just the good part of your father, but, you know, the good and bad part of your father, I guess you are his son. Maybe I'm saying too much because I'm sure my mother's going to listen to the sermon later on. But you see, when we are called children of God, we got to act like God. We may not be God. But we, gotta, we have to strive to try to be like God. We have to strive to try to bear his name and say, that's right, I am on your team, God. I am your son. I am your daughter. We have to try to bear his nature, right? 
where we discern and where we go. Do we, do we love? Do we share kindness? Do we do this? Do we that? Do, but no, even beyond that, knowing that it comes from the nature of God that, you know what? I'm an image bearer of God. I got to really just showcase the love of Christ. Verse 9 kind of seals the deal for us. He cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. If you truly believe in your salvation, if you truly believe that you've been saved, right, then we are called into this confidence where we can say, you know what, I may fall short, but I'm not going to go purposely sin anymore because I'm born of God. And I am of God. I am for God. I pray that that can be us as a church family getting back to our roots. I pray and I charge you that this can be us going back to our basics in our words and actions so that we can have that childlike faith, not, in, not just in our identity, but in our confidence and in our assurance of salvation without any shame. Let us pray.